share a story with you about a young lady named Dee Dee. Dee Dee came from a good family. She was raised with a mother, a father, and a brother. Her mom was Arna. Her father's name was Marcellus, and her brother's name was Jacob. They were close-knit family. Both parents were teachers, school teachers, and Arna decided to follow in their footsteps, and as she grew up, she became a school teacher. A lot of promising things that she wanted to do in her life. And one day came that would change Dee Dee's family forever. Dee Dee was with her boyfriend one day, and she was sitting in his car. And she found herself in the middle of a drug deal that went really bad. Dee Dee was shocked. She couldn't get away. The young man who shot her, his name was Ron Shaw. The day Dee Dee was buried would have been her 27th birthday. The grief was deep for her family. It was deep. So deep, it just took a big toll on the family. Within 10 years of Dee Dee's death, her brother Garrett died of kidney failure. Her father, Marcellus, died of a heart attack. Now, Arna knew what really killed her husband was the fact that he lost both children before they were born. Arna's grief, though, was deep because now Arna was left all alone in the world. The grief and the loss of her daughter, her son, and her husband was unbearable. And she blamed it all on Ron Lowry. Her grief became and turned into a very consuming passion. A passion to make sure that Ron Flowers never experienced freedom again as long as he lived. She lost her entire family. And she knew it was the fault of Ron who killed her husband. When Ron was up for parole, Arna took a deep breath every time. And she voiced her protest at any hint of Ron's parole in prison. And she said that bitter flames burned inside of her. That she deserved to rot in prison. And as long as she had breath, she would make sure that that is where he lived each and every day. Today we already have that story. For the wounded and for the wound which is a true story, had both the wounded and the wounder. Dee Dee's family was so wounded that it led to deep bitterness, deep anger, deep vengeance, sense of revenge. It led to deep, deep resentment. Now, these are natural responses. I'm sure any one of us would naturally put to those feelings. But God says there's a better way. It is natural to feel angry. But God says, don't let that stay with you. Ephesians 4, as we just read that, Ephesians 4 says, get rid of all bitterness rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. What? Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger? Especially with all these injustices? Something like that? Get rid of it? Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Right? That's a tall order. Thinking about exactly what? 
and Didi's family went through. And not just Didi, but what about the things that happened to you? What, God? Get rid of these things? That is a tall order. That is something that almost seems impossible when we are faced with such injustice. But why? Why then, God, would we get rid of this? Why, when things aren't fair, when things aren't right, why would we get rid of this? I'll tell you why. Because bitterness, anger, rage, all of these things that stay soaked too long in your soul, they come between you and God. They come between our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Refusing to forgive, and this is the thing that refusing to forgive is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to take the poison. You see, God wants you to experience the fullness of His love, and when we rage inside with anger, vengeance, mad, when we burn inside with wanting to desire revenge, we are not focusing. God. We are not allowing the Holy Spirit. We are blocking the Holy Spirit's power to come into our hearts, to bring healing, to bring change. When we're all wrapped up in these things, we are not open to the power of God in our lives. So, I guess you probably think, well, Pastor, if I do these things, if I forgive, doesn't that mean I just said that whatever happened to me is okay? And the answer to that is no. No. Forgiveness does not mean you're condoning or excusing bad behavior. Forgiveness is saying that what happened to you is no longer going to take power over you. Saying that you're not going to let it hold you captive any longer. Forgiveness is giving up your need for revenge, your your right to revenge. It doesn't excuse behavior. It is acknowledging the pain and speaking the truth. It's saying, I am not going to let someone else's bad behavior keep me a prisoner in my heart any longer. I'm not going to let someone else's choice of harm make me not experience the joy that I can experience in Christ. It means we stop drinking the poison. You're going to stop drinking the poison because the only person who's dying and getting affected by drinking poison is you. So forgiveness is not excusing, it's not condoning, it's saying, I'm going to choose to let go of the bitterness in my heart. Okay, that's easy said, but how? How? When it's so natural to have these feelings, it is natural. And I'm not saying ignore the feelings. I'm saying you excuse them. How do we do something like that? Well, the first thing we got to do is pray. We need prayer a lot. Prayer. We got to pray, first of all, that God would work on our hearts, that God would bring his healing into our hearts. Pray that God would open our minds and our spirits so that we might be willing to learn how to forgive. So that's the first thing. We got to change our desire to want to learn how to forgive. Once we de- desire to learn how to forgive, we're open to learning, and then we can start to pray. We can start to see what are the steps that I need to take. And you see, when we pray, we ask God, give me eyes to see the person that harmed me in your way. That is hard. Sometimes we don't want to do it. But that's why we're just spending time in prayer. God, give me those eyes. God, change my heart. God, heal my heart. God, help me overcome this pain so that I can get to a place where I can give it to you. You can take it, you can transform it, and you can use it for something good. Change me. Heal me. And then you want to pray that God would change the other person's heart. That you would lead them to want to restore a relationship. But guess what? God can take everything and use it for good. Romans 8.28. Have you seen it? Have you heard it? God is, Romans 8.28 says, For in all things. Oh, wait. Okay. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. In all things, God thinks God works for good. Now, it does not mean that God is going to take something on purpose, cause you harm, so that God can do it good. No, because God cannot will any evil. 
evil. And sometimes what happens to us is evil because God is all good. But God can take what happens to you and use it for something good. Look back to the story of Joseph. Back in Genesis chapter 37 through chapter 47, all the whole story, the whole, the whole, the whole 10 chapters really, about Joseph's life. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers who intended him harm. Joseph went throughout his life sold into slavery and all several things happened along the way in his life. And, and he ended up in the country that he was sold to. He ended up becoming a leader. And at some point in that time, his brothers, his brothers who were very mean to him way back when, and then threw him in a pit and then sold him into slavery, his brothers ended up needing something from him. They come to him in Egypt. And they didn't realize that was their brother they were getting. Look, the one that did all this mean stuff to them. And what does Joseph do? Joseph says, God is all good. What you intended for evil, God intended for good. See, what, what, what happens to us is not always good. But God can take it and come from it and use it for something good. He can use it in our life. The theological basis for us to forgive is that it's hard. Forgiving is hard. Forgiving is hard because we feel like what we're saying to someone is, it's okay. What you did was okay. And I want to say, take that thought and rethink it. Because no, that's not what you're saying. When you're forgiving to someone, you're saying, I'm setting myself free. I'm not setting you free from what you're doing. What you did was wrong. But I'm not going to hold you captive into my enemy and not let my heart be held captive by what you did. Forgiveness is for the forgiven thing. And when we are wounded, when we are wounded deeply, we need healing and we need to pray God heal us. But we need a sense of trust that we need to forgive. We need to forgive. The theological basis, as you said, is this. God forgives us when we forgive. Why do we forgive? Because God first forgave us. Second Corinthians five twenty one says this: God took the sinless Christ and poured into Him our sins. Then, in exchange, He poured God's goodness into us. So, if God can take what is holy and blameless and sinless, and take what is sinful, hard by sin, just stained and horribly messy, and he can say, I will take this sin and I will pour it into this holy sin. And in exchange, I will pour this holiness into you. That's how God works. God heals us first when we forgive. We are not better than God when we forgive. We are not better than God when we forgive. In Ephesians 5, we see that God said, uh, or the, the scripture says, Be kind and compassionate to one, one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave us. And the truth of that is, we are all in need of forgiveness. We are all in need of forgiveness. In our sinfulness, we also wound others. We are the wounded, but we are the wounder. We all hurt others, and we all need forgiveness. That's what it takes. How do you go about that when you are the wound earth? That's some tough stuff. Sometimes we just want to deny that we do wound others. But if we own it, in some ways, the truth of it is, is the human being can almost hardly contain handle true compassion, true acknowledgement of sin, because it, it looks at us so sharply and so inner, it just pierces through our spirit to say, I am So many people can't handle it. They just want to say, I, I didn't mean it, or I'm, I'm wrong, but. But it's me. When we wound others, we have wounded others. We need forgiveness. And how do we do that? Prayer and lots of it. We need 
to spend time in prayer, and it begins with confession, and it begins with repentance. James 5.16 says this, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Whoa. So, he says, confess your sins so that you may be healed. You see the difference? You see the connection? We need to confess. Confession is good for the soul. Confession brings the, all the things that we've done and all the things of the secret of our heart. It brings it out into the light. And when it's in the light, God can take it and, and remold it and bring transformation and healing to that. God sees the motives of our heart. He sees, even if we say, I'm sorry, we, He sees the feeling of our heart. And God may have read the motives of our heart. We can say all the right things. We can do all the right things. But guess what? God's going to look and say, what's really in your heart? That's what matters. I know that the motives of my heart are always nice. I hear it and get it. My heart is the motives of your heart aren't always nice. Hear it and get it. It's just simple. But God's light can bring it out. And God's light can say, wait a minute. I'm going to bring healing. I'm going to expose it. And I'm going to make it so it doesn't have a hold on you anymore. John, chapter, first, first John, chapter 1, verses 7 through 9 says this. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. We're only ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So we need to confess. First thing we need to do is confess and take responsibility. Take responsibility for what we've done. We need to pray and confess to God, and we need to ask for God's grace to be able to confess to the other person. We need to ask and seek forgiveness. Pray that God will forgive us. And then we ask that God would give us courage to seek forgiveness from the people that we have wounded. And we need to say, I am sorry that I hurt you. Not, I am sorry if I hurt you. That's an invasion of responsibility. Not, I'm sorry that you felt when I did. That's saying it's your fault for feeling bad because of what I did to you. Wrong. That's not a true confession and not a true forgiveness or a seeking forgiveness and a true, true apology. It's not saying, well, I'm sorry, but if you wouldn't have done this, that's not a true confession. That's not a true apology. A true apology is, I'm sorry I hurt you. Don't excuse your behavior. Don't justify your behavior. Don't make your behavior a consequence of someone else's action. I wouldn't have if you would have. Give me the humility to do that. And then we pray that God would help the other person to be able to receive that apology. We offer restitution, and we attempt to reconcile a rest of the relationship. If I took something of yours, I need to not just say, I'm sorry I took it, but I need to give it back. We need to give it back. We need to get, make things right again. We need to work at repairing the relationship and building trust. And that takes we have to own the overdone. We need to pray. Pray for the other person. Healing of their heart. We need to pray that God would heal their heart. That God would help their heart to be open to restoration or reconciliation. We need to pray that God's transforming power would be on that relationship. Now, there are times that it may not be safe. And it's in the view or in any view. Sometimes it's just not safe to approach the other person. But we can still do it with an open heart. Or we can say something to somebody and feel better. We can still attempt to reconcile. We need to reconcile with God. And we need to pray that God would take our hearts and take our minds and take our souls and transform it and take it and root out of us all the unclean and evil and anger and bad motives. So that God then pray that God would fill us with 
holiness, humility, compassion. In fact, verse, or a chapter, our scripture in Matthew says this. If we, uh, Matthew 5, it says this. Therefore, if you are offering your gifts, and it talks about confession and, and reconciliation. If you're offering your gifts at the altar, altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, let me say that again. If you are offering your gifts at the altar, and there you remember that your brother or sister, that someone has something against you, leave your gift there. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. And first, go and be reconciled to your brother. Then, come offer your gift. You see, for the sacrifice, when we were talking about offering a sacrifice on the altar, for a sacrifice, it meant it equaled forgiveness of sins. Before Jesus died for the ultimate sacrifice, the, the, the people had to come and offer a sacrifice to be forgiven for their sins. And for this sacrifice to be effective, there needed to be true confession and true restoration. And as Scripture, Jesus was saying, your heart has to be right. If you come before the altar and say, okay, I'm going to offer this for my forgiveness of sins, yet you haven't tried to make it right with those you have wounded, then leave it. Go make it right. And then come back and offer the sacrifice. It had to be, if it hadn't been tried to at least be repaired through the confession and, and, and admission of guilt and then reconciliation, Jesus says, go do that first. If you didn't do that, leave it, go do it, and then come back and offer the sacrifice. And make it right. You see, because what God wants more than any flippant, I'm sorry, it's easy for me to go to God and say, God, I have sinned, and I have hurt so-and-so. Please forgive me. That's the past. What God wants to know in my heart, if I am really repentant, if I'm really repentant, I'm going to go to so-and-so, and I'm going to say, I have sinned against you. And I have hurt you. And I want to be repentant. That's what Scripture says. If we confess our sins, He will forgive us. He will forgive us. That's what God wants so desperately, more than any sacrifice, anything at all. He wants our hearts to be right. He wants us to be right with Him. He wants us to be right with one another. He wants us to feel from deep within through love. He wants compassion. He wants a heart change. He wants mercy. Why? Because that's who God is. He is merciful. He is loving. He is forgiving. And He gives it to us freely. And He often gives that to us when we are wounded. And He offers that to us when we are the wounded. We have to be the ones that are willing we have to be willing to say, I don't want to live with a prisoner or the prisoner of my own sin. I don't want to live with guilt. I don't want to live with hurt. I don't want to live with pain. God, I want to be healed. Make me whole. Heal me. Take the pain. Help me to forgive those who have wounded me. God, help me to seek forgiveness from those who have wounded me. But it is a very merciful gift. And it is a very liberating gift. And it is a very life giving experience that gives you peace. It gives you back your joy. It gives you back your freedom. You will no longer live in pain and hurt and guilt. But God will take that and make it right. And you might be able to minister to someone else who has been hurting you. Spirit that I pray that you would bless them with a new life. It was 14 years ago. 14 years Ron Flowers denied having to do anything with the death of Jimmy Fallon. He denied having any, any responsibility for him. And then one day he was admitted into the Interchange Freedom Initiative, which is part of Prison Fellowship. And during that experience, Ron Flowers gave his heart to Jesus. And 
at that time, Arno's pastor was mentoring prisoners at that prison. And Ron came back to the congregation and invited his congregation to come and be a part of that mentoring program with him. Well, Dean approached the, the pastor and he, he said, would you just find out about Ron's life and just see what's going on? And so there was going on. So the pastor went back and he, he talked to the director of the prison. And then he came back to Arno and he said, Arno, Ron would have liked to see you. And the director would like to see you. So Arno decided he would meet with the director. And the director explained that that Ron's program focused on reconciliation and taking responsibility and ownership. The director said that Ron really wanted to speak with Arno. Well, Arno became furious at that. Furious. He didn't want to speak to Ron. She didn't want to have anything to do with him. And she said, no. She went home. Over time, though, she couldn't get Ron's name face out to anyone. She just kept thinking about it. So she had decided that she would accept him back. In his letter, he said, I am truly sorry for what took place on the 9th of February 9th, 1989. I want to let you know everything. I realize all the pain that I caused you and your family because of my bad choice in life. Just because of my stupid actions. And he said he would like to answer your question if you would like to ask him. Eventually, it took some time, but eventually Arna decided that she she would meet him. And she would ask him, how? Why? Why? The question that burned her for so long. Why did you do that? What were the events of the day? How did it happen? And Ron began to tell her story. He began to confess every detail of that day. He assured Arna that her daughter, Dee Dee, was not involved with the drug. She was just the one caught in the drug. He poured out every detail. He expressed deep regret. As he continued to tell the story, tears began to fall from his own eyes. He began to express more deeply the remorse, the guilt, the regret. And as he talked, his head continued to sink deeper and deeper in bad ways. He was so ashamed of what he had done. He was so ashamed of the acts and the pain that he had caused so many people. He poured out and he confessed, confessed his crime and he took full responsibility for what he did. Now what's going to happen when the message gets through? Dee reached out her hand and she took on his hand. And she had tears flowing down her face. And she looked him in the eyes and she said, I am sorry. I am sorry. I did that. Tears continued to run down her face. She continued to weep and cry, and pretty soon they're embracing. The man who took her daughter's life, who she blamed on taking her entire family from her, now she stands in a full-fledged embrace, and they stand there weeping and crying. And these are her words. There we were, holding each other, weeping together. All these tears putting out the last bitter ending in the end. Washing away the anger I've been carrying for far too long. And letting the love of the Lord flow through me. Three minutes. True forgiveness takes place. True repentance happens. So, is 
care of relationship in marriage and family is not just about the sex. It's about the relationship. Is there a place you need forgiveness? Is there a place where you need to pray? It won't be easy, but it will be good. We are going to take communion together in just a moment. Will you stand with me? And this is a time to come and allow the Holy Spirit to work in your heart. Maybe you just need to be aware of what's going on. Maybe it's I know full well and I need to come and I need to say, God, give me strength and power to be able to work on wholeness or healing or forgiveness or reconciliation. Maybe you have someone you need to bring to the altar and say, this is what's going on. Or you need to lay that before the Lord and say, this is what's going on. Maybe you need to say, you know what, I know someone you need to come and lay this before the Lord. Then you do that first. And when you do that, Till it's too late. Seek healing, seek forgiveness, grant forgiveness, and let God work through His Spirit in your heart and through you. We are all wounded, and we are all wounded by the same God. Let's just come and open up our hearts to God for a moment of silence to come and talk to Him about where you are and where you need to be. Let's pray. We know that you're a God of goodness. Facing these same issues, and we do it because you're doing it in us. You're something good in us, and you're doing it through us. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would take the work of your love and your